Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is brought to you by MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 220. Interesting, though elementary. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, well, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, you are, you are interesting, though elementary. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought I was middle school, but I guess you're right. I am elementary. <laughs> well, as long as you're not out there on the playground kicking kids in the shins or hitting them with your, with your cricket bat. No. Then, uh, you're, you're tadpole to me. Good. Excellent. Well, the show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash ihose220. That will take you to the specific location on ihearofsherlock.com where you can find the show notes for this episode, which will include links and a, uh, uh, an MP3 player, uh, a way to support the show via Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. You can help us keep the lights on here and keep the sounds playing. Um, I, I, I suppose if you don't like the sound you're hearing, then you can speak that way as well with your non-dollars. So thanks for that in advance. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to comment on uh, the episode, you can do it right there on the show notes, or you can certainly email us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. You'll want to stay tuned later in this episode because we do have another canonical couplet quiz coming up where we will not only announce the winner of the last episode, who will receive a copy of the Baker Street Almanac, but you'll want to stay tuned for this time because we'll give you an opportunity to win a book by our interview subject today. Who is that? Well, we're about to tell you. Well, Rob Nunn felt that Stapleton's introduction to Watson from The Hound of the Baskervilles was an apt one for his blog because, well, he's going to introduce himself as a homely folk who do not wait for formal introductions, as his first blog post said. You know, Rob has been a contributor here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a regular written contributor, and he's been a guest on the show before on episode 142, where he talked about his book, The Criminal Mastermind of Baker Street. But of course, Rob's own mastermind took itself to interesting, though elementary, his blog at interesting though elementary blogspot.com because Rob had more to say than I guess we were allowing him to say here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Rob is the head of the parallel case of St. Louis, a science society, and he's a member of the noble bachelors of St. Louis and the harpooners of the sea unicorn. And he's been teaching a unit on Sherlock Holmes to his fifth grade students for the past few years. That's in and among when he hasn't been writing for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere or winning the Beacon Society Award. But we want to hear directly from Rob himself, who is coming back here to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, despite 
his better judgment. Rob, welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thanks for having me back. It's a pleasure. Anytime, anytime. So refresh us, Rob, because um, I was reading off of your bio, which you wrote, gosh, six years ago for your blog. You, you've actually accomplished a lot in the world of uh, Sherlock Holmes since then, haven't you? Well, yeah, I was on a, an episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, so it's all downhill <laughs> after that. <laughs> That's what Bert and I keep telling ourselves, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I've become program chair of the Beacon Society. We, uh, the Parallel Case of St. Louis, put on a Homes in the Heartland conference since then. So it's been uh, just trying to keep the wheels spinning and doing whatever I can to keep myself active and out of trouble. Well, those are a couple of major uh, accomplishments. Why don't we start with the Beacon Society first? How did you get involved with the Beacon Society, and what is the Beacon Society, if you will? The Beacon Society is a, uh, a society that its, its purpose is to help teachers and educators and anybody that works with young students or, or high school students um, reach out and introduce Sherlock Holmes to the world. And uh, if I may, re if I remember correctly, somebody on this uh, podcast was one of the founding members there, Mr. Monty. Uh, maybe. Monty. Maybe. But, um, so, so you've been teaching Sherlock Holmes in your classroom for a while. How did you, how did you start that process? Um, it, the uh, traveling exhibit that was going around from uh, different science centers to science centers came to St. Louis years ago. And I tried putting together a uh, field trip, but our district was on budgetary restrictions for that. So I thought, well, why not just start teaching it in my classroom? And I applied for a grant from the Beacon Society. They paid for my classroom to get um, everybody got their own set of the canon, the classic starts canon that are adapted for fourth and fifth grade students. And we just took it away from there. And we did about two weeks of Sherlock Holmes. The kids, they do reader's theater plays. They put on their version of the Blue Carbuncle and the Redheaded League. And we, we, they write their own stories. Um, I, my kids have put Sherlock Holmes in space. Um, they were trying to find some MBA Gucci slippers in one story. I mean, whatever the kids want to do, um, they write their own. The only restriction is Sherlock Holmes has to be a character. He's been a dog. He's been a mouse and all those stories. They're, they're, they're fun to read. That's terrific. Have you come across any other similar character, I mean, non Sherlockian, but similar character based educational efforts like this? The Sherlock Holmes thing seems to me to be very unique. Yeah, I haven't found anything that's very, that's specific to just a character like this. Um, yeah, the Beacon Society does great and it's so open ended. If whatever you want to do, as long as it's helping to introduce homes to, to kids, they're right there ready to help any educator or playwright or theater troupe or summer camp or a ton of libraries have been getting grants for that stuff. So it's, it's amazing seeing what all the people are. And, as program chair, I get to see all these grants that come through, and it just blows my mind how wide-ranging all of the endeavors have been. Yeah, that's super. That's remarkable. Well, and and uh, I I wasn't mistaken in believing that you yourself, Rob, are a past recipient of the uh, Beacon Award. Is that correct? That yeah. Um, for my for the unit that I developed a couple years later, I applied for the Beacon Award and was lucky enough to win and you get a uh, for me it was great i got a, a year subscription to the journal which i'm a huge fanboy of that anyway and and that the, they give you a 221 and dollar check that goes with it and that went right back into my classroom library to buy more sherlockian books for the kids that's fantastic i kept the, I kept the baker street journal for myself though well a, a, as you should as you should and as everyone should um they're they're not a sponsor here on this episode you can listen to uh the baker street journal as our sponsors over on trifles our other podcast but uh it's a wonderful ringing endorsement for them uh you've got there rob um yes. and I, you know i love the idea that you know you you weren't able to take the kids to the exhibition so you basically became the exhibition on their behalf yeah as long as we don't refer to me as being an exhibitionist i'm on board with that <laughs> 
Have you heard from prior students? Have, have prior students come back to you and said, you know, boy, that was a lot of fun? Yeah, every now and again, you'll get kids that come back. Um, I just had a kid and his girlfriend who was, they were both in my class. They came back to visit me as they were getting ready to graduate last year. And we sat around, but seven years to, uh, you know, between fifth grade and 12th grade, that's almost half a lifetime for these kids. So it's, uh, I'm happy when they were even remember my name, let alone some of the specific lessons I've taught them. Well, you've given them a, a classroom experience that I think is unlike any other. Uh, no question. So I, I hope it's something that not only sticks with them through their schooling, but, you know, in life beyond. And hopefully they can extend that, that pleasure to someone else along the way as well. Yeah, as long as they just remember who Sherlock Holmes is and they have that little seed of knowledge buried back in their brain, you know, hopefully someday they'll come back across the Holmes stories and go, oh, wait, I remember these were really fun to read. That's that's perfect. That is perfect. So, Rob, you started writing for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere when? I, my, my mind is a little fuzzy on this. You, you would think oh. I, I would know being the administrator of the site. But, if only we had somebody that had this knowledge at their fingertips. Yeah, I know. Uh, man, I don't, uh, 2004, maybe? You ever take? Oh, gosh. No, that, that can't be right. Maybe no, 14. Maybe 14. Yeah, 14. 14. Sorry. That's... Yeah, we, we weren't in existence quite yet in, uh, in, in 04. Um, yeah, 14. We, we actually, we've been around since 2005, so you were close, but, um, and, and, I mean, obviously, you, you had an opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, anything that your little heart desired on our site. But at a certain point, you decided, you know what? I've, I've had enough of these guys. Uh, I want to, I want to branch off on my own. Talk us through the, the, the thought process where you go, Hey, um, I need the additional responsibility of running my own site and updating it and writing for it and all the rest. Yeah, I didn't have enough stressors in my life with a full-time job and family. So, um, well, I, so the criminal mastermind of Baker Street that I was on the previous episode for came out through MX and, um, they really said, you know, if you're going to have a, a book come out, we really recommend you have a blog. And I didn't know any better. So I thought, great, I can do that. Um, and then I realized, oh, if I'm going to run my own blog, I don't have time to, um, write for, other people um so it, it the blog inter, interesting though elementary took off mostly it at the beginning it was a promotion for the book and then i realized how quickly how boring that got to write and read just hey here's this week's post here's a reminder i have a book um and so after about two or three self congratulatory posts i i thought well maybe i should write about interesting things so it took off from there and and how do you define interesting, Rob? Well, very different than my wife does when I start talking about Sherlock Holmes stuff, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I am – I mean, I love the canonical stories. I love the characters. But what keeps me coming back to this is all of the people that I've met through this hobby. I've yet to meet a boring Sherlockian and just – the conversations that I've had online or in conferences or at Scion meetings just are always so interesting and engaging. I thought, why not try and take that and put that out there for other people to share? Um, and really anything that's related to Sherlock Holmes, I'll, I'll give it a swipe. Yeah. Well, you know, you carried that, you expressed that interest too in your very first post on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, which was October 19th, 2015, because you had just been to your very first Science Society meeting, the harpooners of the sea unicorn. And one of the things that um, struck you was you were pleasantly surprised. You sat down with a group of Sherlockians ranging from high school age to retirement. And the dinner conversation ranged from news of the Pope to the books of John Green but then quickly delved into the problem of Hall Pycroft's gullibility. And I love that. I, and that really sums up Sherlockians in a nutshell. We all have this interest that we can always circle back to, but you, 
everybody is so intelligent. I was just talking with another friend yesterday who's he's hoping to go to New York this year, but he's kind of skittish. He's like, I don't know anybody there. And I said, it doesn't matter. Every every Sherlockian you meet is so welcoming. And you can talk. Yeah, you can sit and talk about your favorite stories, but they'll also want to hear about your job and you they have interesting jobs and you know what everybody's reading or what's on tv it's just a, a really great Sherlock, the Sherlockian universe is full of people that are just great conversationalists and so easy to talk to yeah it really is and, and look rob you can reassure him because we've all been there you know we, we've all been in a similar circumstance and you can say hey look i was born not knowing anyone <laughs> and look at me today <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's the thing. The, the Sherlockians are all welcoming, uh, no matter where you go, whether it is, uh, it's your local group or, uh, you know, a broader, uh, greeting, uh, of folks or even, uh, meeting people online, as I know a lot of people have done in the last couple of years. So, um, harpooners of the sea unicorn. Just by hearing the name of that group, one would think, that you would be located somewhere on the coast. Where are they based? Uh, St. Charles, Missouri, and it's on a river, so I guess that counts as something. But the story with that is the uh, uh, airline airplane defense manufacturer, McDonnell Douglas, was based out of there for a while, and they made the Harpoon missile. So when the Scion Society started years oh, ago, yeah. they decided to call themselves the, Har uh, the Harpooners of the Sea Unicorn. And, and who... From a Sherlockian perspective, was on the Sea Unicorn. Well, oh, in the story yes. or in, in the, at the science? Oh, that's Black Peter. There you go. Well, that that makes perfect sense then. Although I have to wonder if Conan Doyle couldn't have couldn't have saved a little ink if he simply called it a narwhal instead of a Sea <laughs> Unicorn. <laughs> Doesn't sound nearly as uh, literary. Uh, well, um, that is, that is fantastic. So as you, uh, as you've explored more in the world of Sherlockians and Sherlock Holmes, and you've been, uh, as I said, part of, uh, uh, these numerous science societies, including, uh, the parallel case of St. Louis. That's another, uh, uh, steeped, uh, in, in, uh, in, in a lot of tradition, uh, society. Um, have you, have you noticed anything that, it continues to work, say that that's been part of a tradition there versus maybe some of the newer uh, things that you've noticed as you've been out and about. Um, I think for our societies, really just the openness of everything. Um, I really like the idea of with, um, oh, what's that called? Where people, uh, on the, comedy troops where they are trying to figure things out like improv or uh... improv yeah. thank you um I, I really like the idea with improv troops of the yes and where people come in with an idea and you say yes that's great and then build off um you know w we all come to that we all come to this because we're interested in sherlock holmes for whatever reason whether it was benedict cumberbatch or jeremy brett or the stories in in totality um so just keeping that in mind that we're all interested in the same character. Now, some people may love their fan fiction. Some people may love elementary, but it all boils down to it all started from, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle trying to make a few extra bucks because he didn't have enough patience. So that is that is medical practice. I'm not sure how patient he was. <laughs> he, he must he must have been patient to wait those hours in his waiting room by himself with nothing else to do other than, well, write and read. Well, I'm glad it worked out that yeah. way. So, you know, I, I asked you before about what you considered to be interesting, and, and you just used the word uh, interested, as uh, all Sherlockians are interested in some form of Sherlock Holmes. Have you ever met a non-interesting <laughs> Sherlockian? <sighs> I don't think so. I mean, unless I count the one I see in the mirror every morning. Other than that, everybody brings something to the table. Um, and they all have such a, a wealth of background knowledge. Our parallel case 
Zion Society meetings. It's great. We, we have a couple doctors that show up and they always bring things. And, and uh, we have a gentleman who's from India. He understands the whole um, region of Asia and Europe over there better than any of us do. There's a ton of people that are steeped in history. We've uh, one of our members, she loves Victorian tea and the uh, Victorian age. So she can go on and on about that stuff. And there's plenty of people that will talk about the media adaptations and Everybody brings something to the table. That is superb. Well, if we're going to uh, just pause a moment here so one of our sponsors can bring something to the table, we will be right back and continue our conversation with Rob Nunn. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Kind of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Well, that's exactly what the Wes Express has done. Built a time machine in style to take you back to 1986 and the first issues of the Sherlock Holmes Review. Groundbreaking interviews with Jeremy Brett and Peter Cushing. Rare reprints from the Strand magazine. Like a day with Dr. Conan Doyle, and a profile of William Gillette as Sherlock Holmes. All four issues of Volume 1, almost impossible to find today, can be yours, reprinted in a handsome 7x10 volume. Take a trip back to the Sherlockian fever of the 1980s. With the Sherlock Holmes Review Anthology, Volume 1, available right now at wessexpress.com. We're back talking with Rob Nunn about Interesting Though Elementary, his Sherlockian blog that has really taken on a life of its own over the last few years. So, Rob, when when did you move from, uh, say, just the observational stuff that you found interesting to um, this newer format maybe you can tell us about? So um, around 20 – the end of 2017 – uh, one of the Chris Redman anthologies was coming out, and I guess they were short on writers, so he reached out and asked me to contribute. Um, and I had done an interview with him promoting the book that was coming out at the beginning of the year, and I realized, oh, it's way more interesting to let other people do the talking, and it's way less work, too, so let's do that. Um, and it kind of took off from there. It started with uh, Chris Redmond in, in January that year, and then I reached out, kind of asking just a couple other fun people that I knew, you know, like Brad Kefauver, Beth Gallego, things like that. And then I kind of thought, oh, well, let's make this into a monthly thing, because there's so many people in the Sherlockian world that just – have such great insight. And yeah, you know, some of them are really well known. Others are never heard of outside of their local scions. So I started doing that just monthly here and there, and they just picked up more and more hits and more and more people said, Oh, these are great. I really enjoy them. And now I'm doing two interviews every month uh, with a, a different Sherlockian one in the first half of the month and one in the second half. Well, that's a great model. You know, Bert, we ought to try something like that. Yeah, You'll like- never guess where I got the idea from. <laughs> there seem to be quite a few publications that, that are doing that, either in video or written format these days. Well, yeah, it makes it hard to not step on other people's toes. No. Like, oh, well, they've already been on this one. Not not, not at all, because I think you, you do a great job of bringing out – I mean, you've, you've got your, your typical set of questions, and what it does is it kind of sets the audience up for – um, what to expect, right? So they know when the interesting though elementary interview comes out, they, they know the cadence and everybody who answers it answers it differently in their own interesting way. And that's the beauty of it. You know, you, you have, you have a regular, uh, set of questions and an irregular set of answers. <laughs> yeah, I, it's very nice to know. I mean, it's just a set of 10 questions. So when I reach out to, ask somebody if they'd be interested. I can say it's 10 email questions. It's nothing too big. Um, and eight of them are always the same. 
but like you said, the, the difference in the answers are so fascinating, especially I'm, I'm a big book nerd. So I love getting all the different titles of which books they think everybody should read. And, and some of them always are picking up the votes and every now and again, you'll get one out of just complete left field where you go, Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so t- tell me about that. What, what, what was one of those that uh, kind of struck your fancy that you, you recall? Oh, I knew you'd ask me as soon as I said that. Uh, um, there. Um, oh, you've listened to the show before, have you? Yeah. Oh, I, I'm pretty sure I've listened to 219 episodes before today. So, Aww. I um, some of them will throw out some really obscure, like you know, the early printings from uh, the BSI press, and I think, well, that would be nice if you know more than four copies of it existed and somebody could read it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Klinger's books are always mentioned in one e- e- either Klinger or Baring Gould. I, I don't, I bet I can count less than five interviews that have not mentioned one of those two pillars. Mm. And have you, have you gotten less Klinger as an interview on your, your site yet? I did. And I was such a fanboy. I, I was lucky it was through, uh, email because I was like, Oh my God, let's clean your email me back. Uh, and then I got to meet him in 2019 in New York in person. And he is just the nicest guy. I think here's this huge name in this hobby. Somebody I've revered and his writing is just so impressive. And he just walks up and he goes, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> That's less. Uh, have you gotten William S. Baring Gould as an interview yet? <laughs> No, it turns out he's not easy to uh, – he's not easy to get a hold of. Dang. My Ouija board <laughs> skills aren't up to snuff. That's Bert's area of specialty. Yes. I <laughs> love the Ouija board. Have you – are there any sort of – when you think back of all the people, I mean, do you – is there anyone that surprised you along the way where you got an answer and you said, oh, or is there anybody who suggested a book and you said, oh, I haven't heard about that. I think I've got to go buy that. Um. Yeah, I just did Nicholas Utekin earlier this summer, and um, he talked about his Sherlock Holmes at Oxford title. Oh, yeah, and yeah. So I looked that up, and I was like, why have I never heard about this? Because it came out decades ago. <laughs> I, I, he was rattling things off like he had just sent it to the printers a few weeks ago, and his knowledge is just so spot on that he was pulling, th- pulling out facts that he had written before I was born. That's his, that's his book that he calls The Controversity, right? I think yes. he just updated it within the last couple of years. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, yeah. and if, if you're lucky and you happen to catch Nick on, on, um, the, the, just the right moment, uh, occasionally he'll send you a copy like that. You know, if he stumbles across an extra copy in a, in a cupboard or something <laughs> like that, uh, he's, he's good like that. And that, that's, that's the thing with, with Sherlockians, whether it's Les Klinger, uh, whether it's Nick Utekin, uh, you know, these giant names known to people in, in the world or, you know, just somebody walking in off the street. They are all lovely, lovely people and uh, just a delight to get to know. So much so. In fact, I, I just drove down to Southern Illinois yesterday and visited with a fellow Sherlockian, Bill Cochran, who's a friend of mine. Mm. And I, we were hanging out at his house. He's like, oh, here in my spare closet, this is where I keep the first editions of the sign of four because I don't have – it's like oh, that – it's a good problem to have. But at the end, he was like, oh, hey, hang on just a second. He goes out to his garage and then comes back. He's like, here, I'm not reading these books anymore. You can have them. And, <laughs> I mean, not the, not the first edition sign of fours, but great titles that I'm just like, well, my, my weekend is planned. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I mean, you should have really pressed him. You said, are you really still reading those first edition sign of fours? <laughs> I'll just sneak one under. Well, he was busy telling us that, talking about how all the side interests that Sherlockians have. We sat around and talked about books, and he's like, "Did I ever tell you about the time that I sat down and talked to Ringo Starr and George Harrison at Apple Studios?" I'm just like, "Oh my god, <laughs> unbelievable!" Okay, how does that happen? He was in a when he was stationed over in Europe. Um, somehow. One of the locals was asking what town he was from, and he says Carbondale, Illinois. And uh, the local says, oh, is that right by this other small town, which George Harrison's sister happened to live in? (laughs) And, I mean, these towns don't even have a comma in their population number. I mean, they're small. 
And uh, the next day, the guy pulls up and says, hey, mate, you want to go to Apple Studios with me? <laughs> and then just took him on over. And uh, uh, Bill was telling the story. He said, yeah, I'm trying to learn this one guitar part for Here Comes the Sun. And uh, George just taught it to him. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. And he saved that story for as I was in the driveway getting ready to leave. Of course. <laughs> oh, by the way, have I told you my Beatles story? Yes. <laughs> Oh, well, well the, are there that that brings up an interesting question. Are there connections between the Beatles and Sherlock Holmes? Uh, John Lennon, didn't he write a poem or draw some pictures there? And I know there's uh, Howard Ostrom's probably the person to ask about this, but I would bet there's got to be pictures of all four of them in the Deerstalkers <laughs> throughout their careers. <laughs> Uh, I think you are right about John Lennon and uh, and his poetry and and sketches and 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 there are, uh, as a matter of fact, there there is a uh, a photo uh, where it's Lennon himself who's wearing the deerstalker, and I think um, and and there's uh, Ringo there, kind of uh, in a fedora or trilby. Um, and it looks like there's another photo from the same series where uh, it looks like. No, that's John Lennon again in the uh, in the Deerstalker. So he's wearing it in a couple of photos, and there's a couple of uh, rather crude sketches that he's done. Uh, so I think we can say we're we're just two steps away from John Lennon. Anytime we pick up the cannon, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, lots of inspiration there. Mm. Now, Rob, we talked to you, you know, back in 2018 in episode 142 about the criminal mastermind of Baker Street, which was your book. Um, you thinking about writing any more about? Uh, Actually, I've got a, a manuscript here. I've been qu pitching to agents this summer. It's a, um, I've taken stories from the canon and lessons from my teaching unit and have adapted it to a, uh, a young reader's version. So I'm, I'm trying to, get that with an agent so I can go to a larger audience. I love the Sherlockian publishers and I, I mean, my paycheck shows that they get most of it. Um, but my hope would be to get this with a publishing house. They can get it out a little more worldwide. So that's the current project I'm working on. Oh, that's great. Great idea. Yeah. Yeah. What, so, how, what did you do in terms of which stories did you, the reason, one of the reasons why I ask is I've told this story before, but my oldest daughter, when she was very young, I gave her foolishly the Speckled Band is the first story to read, and it just scared her to death. <laughs> and uh, so, what 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 have you gone through in terms of getting some of these stories ready for younger readers? Um, well, it's been years of I've been teaching the classroom lessons for six or seven years now, so um, the ones that hit with the kids and the ones that don't. Um, and I always have my kids give me feedback at the end of the year, you know, rank these stories in order one to five. What do you like most? What do you don't? Um, the copper beaches. I love that story. And we've got, we use a, a graphic novel version of it in the classroom, but that is typically the ones that the kids are like, yeah, that, that stepdad was really creepy. I didn't like him. So, <laughs> um, I left that one out of the book, but I mean, you can't, Redheaded League, Blue Carbuncle, Scandal in Bohemia. Um, let's see, what else do I have in here? Uh, Barrel Cornet, uh, Silver Blaze, and I saved Speckled Band for the end. So if it scares them, well, there's no more book to read. <laughs> That's smart. I like that. Okay, so can you picture yourself one day teaching the Rob Nunn edition in your classroom? <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like that may be a little self-congratulatory of like those professors in college. They're like, here's the syllabus. Go buy my books. <laughs> well, that's a great moneymaker. Yeah, it is. Well, think of all the signed copies you can, uh, you can sell. Uh, yeah. Well, those how kids, you, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go ahead. How did you, how did you handle unusual words and things? Are there annotations in your uh, manuscript, or did you sort of edit things out? I, I edited it all to make it fourth and fifth grade accessible. Um, we spend a lot of time at this grade level with text accessibility, reading levels, things like that. So as I went through with all of the stories and all of the – I've got 
essays in between kind of explaining what the role of the narrator is and, you know, what, how things were in Victorian London, things like that. Um, a lot of checking and running it through programs to make sure the words I was using as I'm, as I'm retelling these stories are words that, uh, that are accessible. I mean, kids don't necessarily need to know what a handsome cab is. They can just say a cab or a carriage and the same point gets across. Yeah. Indubitably. Yeah. I left that one out too. <laughs> so Rob, as you, as you think through the, how many interviews have you, have you done now on interesting though elementary? Oh goodness. Uh, well, I started in January, 20, 18 and still going. So probably more than 50. Yeah, I would say so. I I, I would say that's more than 50. You, 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 I can tell you're not a, you're not a math teacher. Um, no, I'm not a numbers guy. (laughs) Stick with the literature. So yeah, there you go. So uh, as you think back through the, let's say, uh, close on a hundred, uh, uh, interviews that you've done. Um, is there anyone who has escaped you that you you've you've really wanted to interview and have not yet landed? Uh, yeah. If anybody out there has contact information for Neil Gaiman, I'll I'll take that. I'll I'll, I'll put him on the blog. <laughs> um, no, everybody that I've reached out to has been really um, helpful. A few people have said, "Now is not a good time. Can you come back to me in a month or two? I completely understand that. You know, life gets in the way, but. Every, I mean, I've had everybody from like Peter Blau. I've had both hosts of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere on there. Um, and then, you know, every now and again, I'll just grab one of my, uh, um, my local Scion members because I find them just as interesting to talk to as, you know, the people with the huge collections. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. I mean, there's, there's regular names that everyone knows because they're in annotated editions or their names are in the Baker Street Journal or, uh, you know, they're, they're going from Scion meeting to Scion meeting. They are known entities, but it's these hidden gems, right? These people that you see at the local meetings that are never going to get out of their, right. their local setting that you're like, I want to bottle this up and I want to introduce it to the rest of the world. And what the great thing about the Zoom meetings, I, I think a lot of people have experienced that. You can pop into a meeting and just kind of be a fly on a wall and just go, I've never seen some of these people before, but I really want to be friends with them now because mm. they're, they're just so impressive to listen to. And as, as you've done that, as you've popped into these Zoom meetings, I think it's a, a thing we've all had a chance to do over the last year and a half. Have you picked up any ideas that you wanted to kind of bring back home to your own Scion meetings? Yeah, I, I'm really hoping that when the parallel case, we, we took a summer break. Um, when we start back up in September, I would love for us to be able to do hybrid meetings if the numbers in Missouri are going to allow us to meet in person because I don't want to lose all those nationwide and international connections that we've made. But I'm definitely going to check out the uh, other groups that try it first. I'll, I'll let them be the uh, guinea pigs on that one. <laughs> That's fair. But a lot of other ones just – um just really sitting back and waiting and uh, just giving that wait time of I'm going to ask a question and then just wait about three seconds. And that uh, uncomfortableness, I've noticed somebody always speaks up. It's great. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be me talking all the time. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we like to fill silences. <laughs> um, you mentioned at the top of the show, in addition to uh, running the site, going to these scion meetings that you had initiated oh, a little gathering called homes in the heartland what's that all about that was just we thought um a couple years ago that we were gonna we had dedicated a research collection at the st louis public library um it had been Sort of a dusty collection that had been tucked away in a closet in a college over in Illinois, uh, back in the, and, uh, that college didn't want it anymore. So the St. Louis Public Library said, yeah, we'd be interested in that. And then people had donated a lot of other things to it. It was essentially uh, a complete run of the Baker Street Journal up until about the eighties and like, three other books. Um, once we got word out in the St. Louis region that we were going to start this collection at the public library, 
tons of books came in and just some really impressive things. Um, so we had a local dedication, but then we thought let's open it up and kind of publicize that St. Louis has this Sherlock Holmes research collection. So we, it turned into a whole big conference. Um, we had some, a lot of fun, some great speakers. We, you know, uh, did a barbecue dinner, uh, on Friday night, um, took some, did some, an afternoon tea on Sunday, uh, just to kind of, we, we wanted it to be Sherlockian, but also St. Louisan. And, uh, our second one was slated to be last year. COVID pushed that back. So we had hoped to have it actually last weekend. COVID pushed that back too. So, uh, Homes in the Heartland will be back probably 2023, I'm thinking, because we, uh, next summer is going to be Minnesota, and you don't compete with Minnesota. <laughs> no, you don't. That's good. Well, and and given uh, that you need to wait another two years, I think that gives Missouri um, at, at least enough time to get out of the one uh, seventh or eighth wave of COVID that'll hit it by then. So, my goodness, yeah, that's uh, not going anywhere anytime yeah, soon. It looks like. I'll say. So, th- so to me, this sounds like the only. Um, Sherlockian weekend gathering that is centered around barbecue. <laughs> well, you can't go wrong with barbecue. No. Uh, no. Actually, when I drove down to see uh, Bill Cochran uh, yesterday, it was on the back of, hey, I'm driving down to this barbecue restaurant in the town next door. Do you want to get together? So I'll, I'll travel for barbecue. That's a great excuse. Yeah, me too. Boy, oh boy. That's uh, fabulous. And you have no shortage. We have so many. St. Louis, yeah. We have so many great barbecue restaurants around here in St. Louis. It's unbelievable. Now, that collection uh, that uh, kind of kicked off the whole thing, was that a, a remnant of uh, Phil Schreffler being down in the area at some point? Um, yeah, there was some remnants left over from him. Um, Bill Cochran, like I said, donated some stuff. I think Barry Happner, his collection had uh, some things and made it to there. Um, really just a, a lot of stuff that were all over the shelves and now it's a beautiful they've got a couple cabinets it's in the uh, rare book and manuscript room of the uh, central branch of the st louis public library which is a gorgeous building in and of itself so when uh this latest homes in the heartland was going to go on we were also going to include they do an architectural tour of the central library so it was going to be that and a viewing of the research collection because um Man, you can't walk through that central library in St. Louis and not be awed by some of the architecture they have there. Yeah, no doubt. Ba- back when we built temples to literature. <laughs> yeah. That was the same, the same era that brought us temples to transportation. Now the best we can do is, you know, nice shelving units in our home offices. <laughs> yeah. IKEA need not apply. Well, um, Rob Nunn, if people would like to find out more about you, more about Interesting Though Elementary, where should they go? Um, the blog is interestingthoughelementary.blogspot.com, and I'm on Twitter at Rob underscore Nunn. Fantastic. And we ought to note, because uh, you mentioned it in passing uh, when you talked about the first interview you did on the uh, the site there with Chris Redman, the book was about being a Sherlockian, which is a, uh, a fine book. I know Chris did about 60 and then about being a Sherlockian, kind of a nice pair of, uh, of, of, of 60 uh, numbered chapter books there with uh, lots of interesting uh, and elementary content. <laughs> So, well, Rob Nunn, thank you so much for being back here with us on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, and uh, we wish you all the best. Thanks again for the invitation. You know, it's not just the Beacon Society, but it's thrilling, frankly, to talk to Rob and to hear about his new manuscript because presenting these stories along with the lesson plans, along with guidance, along with some of the literary touchstones, the role of the narrator, other things, it's a magnificent educational experience. I can't imagine a kid going through this in middle school and having it not make a lasting impression on him. And then you know, the interviews and his blog, it's just, uh, 
he's you know he's become so dedicated to this and it's wonderful i think the 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 whole community is much better off because of it yeah i mean you think about rob as a touchstone for the introduction of sherlock holmes to kids not only through what he's been doing but through this new manuscript this new um you know, a, a reference material that uh, hopefully any teacher can get their hands on. Um, and, and then couple that with all of the follow-up they can do online, all of the right. things he's been doing, all of the uh, resources that he can introduce to people uh, online. Uh, there, there's a whole host of information. I mean, my goodness, we've got a uh, almost like a, a miniature John Bennett Shaw here, a Johnny Appleseed of the Sherlockian world. Introducing young people to Sherlock Holmes. Well, you may recall us speaking to playwright David McGregor here on episode 140. The good news is our friends at MX Publishing now have some of David McGregor's work in stock. Three new books by David McGregor, including... Sherlock in Love, the Holmes Adler Mysteries. These are a triptych of plays that first appeared at the Purple Rose Theater in Chelsea, Michigan. The Adventure of the Elusive Ear, The Adventure of the Fallen Souffle, and The Adventure of the Ghost Machine. All three are creative and bring Holmes into contact with other people whom you may have heard of, including Vincent Van Gogh, Auguste Escoffier, and Tesla and Edison. Adding to the other group of books is David's two-volume series, Sherlock Holmes, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. In these books, David takes us on a journey through the late 1800s, early 1900s, through the end of the 20th century and into the 21st, as Sherlock Holmes has been played by so many different actors and was brought to life by so many different forces. David takes us through these various times and introduces us to names that you may be familiar with and names that may be new to you. All three of these books are available at mxpublishing.com today. Ah, you know that music. That means, once again, it's time for everyone's favorite quiz show. That's right, it's Canonical Couplets, where we give you two lines of poetry, and you give us the Sherlock Holmes story that you think they refer to. Now, if you recall, around these parts, the last time, we gave you this clue. An unmarked body and diabolical agency will require Watson... To act tenaciously. Bert, do you know the story we are referring to? Yes, I do know the story. This is the rare time when Watson dined with Holmes and the entree was served without stuffing. That's the case he called The Adventure of the Empty Grouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was about to grouse, but that was actually pretty good. That was pretty good. Uh, well, once again, Bert, you have done it. Uh, you have absolutely missed by 100 yards the mark on, uh, on this one. Um, we were looking, of course, for the Hound of the Baskervilles. The Hound of the Baskervilles. But here, you, you are in good company because, once again, our pal Eric Deckers he uh, he said this was um, the story of a British baronet vacationing in Florida who suffers a grim fate when he goes swimming 10 minutes after eating a hot dog. It's the drowned of the Jacksonville. <laughs> oh, Eric, Eric, you are really competing with Bert here for the worst of the worst. Aww. That's W U R S T. Sorry, had to do. I I couldn't let the two of you just drown out there all together. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So uh, we will uh, take out our big prize wheel and once again give it a big spin. And it's going round and round, landing on number. 28, number 28, and that corresponds to 
Tom Huntington. Hey, Tom, congratulations. Glad to see you here as a repeat winner. Always happy to have people jumping back in. We will be sending you a copy of the Baker Street Almanac as a thank you gift for answering that quiz item from the last episode where we talked to Ross Davies about the Baker Street Almanac. I should mention, Bert, that we did trick a few people last time. We had answers that ranged from the Devil's Foot to uh, Lady Frances Carfax, as well as the Hound of the Baskerville. So, um, good job on thinking up this canonical couplet in your in your trickiness. Oh, very good. I know, I know. Well, let's uh, let's give it a go with the next canonical couplet. Here we go. An amateur tenor, charming, only 34. How could his scheme bring England to the very brink of war? If you think you know the canonical couplet answer here, put it in an email address to comment that I hear of Sherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose you at random, you will win. Good luck. And our lucky winner that time, this time, I should say, gets a copy of Rob Nunn's book, The Criminal Mastermind of Baker Street. And thanks to our publisher friends, our, our, uh, our, our sponsors there, MX Publishing, who you heard just before Canonical Couplet. Well, Bert, can you believe that it's here once again? The, 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 the end is nigh. And you know what? Um, we, we have a very... Very special episode coming up next. It's we episode do. number 221. <laughs> Amazing that we've made it 221 episodes here. Yeah. And, and it will represent 60 stories and 17 steps for Baker Street. So that'll be 77 minutes long. <laughs> so everybody better get a pillow because we're going to do it completely canonically. That would be great. Well, and we should also mention that we have been gathering all kinds of wonderful quiz prizes from our friend Tony Katroki, a uh, an avid supporter and listener of the show. Thank you very much for that, Tony. And we have been getting so much, in fact, that we have outstripped our cadence for canonical couplets. So stay tuned, because I think later in the summer or into early fall, we are going to do a special episode, a special giveaway episode. And I think, hmm, well, we'll figure out exactly how this is going to, to go, but I think we will give uh, the advantage to our supporters, people who support us on PayPal or Patreon, giving them a chance for first dibs on these many prizes that we have. It's just going to be a giveaway. Right, uh, We will be in touch with you and explain more about that. So make sure you're signed up to receive the email updates on IHearOfSherlock.com where we will be talking about this wonderful giveaway in the future. In the meantime, I remain the future perfect Scott Monty. And I'm the past participle Bert Wolder. Oh, and together we say... The, the Games... games. A foot. <laughs> the, the game's a foot. Well, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes.